Welcome to Kubernetes SIG apps for Monday, May 13th, 2019. Uh, it looks like uh, I'm Matt Farina and with us, uh, we have all three co-chairs here, Adnan and Ken are here. Um, and so I'll start by sharing the meeting minutes into an agenda into chat here so everyone can get on the same page. And uh, the first thing up is we actually have a bunch of announcements. Uh, the first one is, is that Janet is going to be joining us as a, uh, we're planning on her joining as a new co-chair to SIGAPS. She has been one of the people that has been leading in the workloads APIs for some time. She's been co-chairing the last year's worth of KubeCons and Cloud Native Cons with her last one, I believe, coming up here in a couple of weeks and uh or in next week actually um and so she we've invited her to come in and so uh welcome janet um but one of the things we want to do uh per the governance we can um there's a governance policy for this and we, we went along and followed it but we wanted to open it up to any comments um did anybody have any comments or thoughts on this as janet comes to join us once twice three times Oh, uh, thank you and welcome Janet. Um, the next thing up is that the next two SIGAPS meetings are gonna be canceled. Um, the next one is uh, during KubeCon, Cloud Native Con in Europe. And so we're gonna go ahead and cancel that because a number of folks can't make it and they're gonna be running around busy. And then the one after that is Memorial Day in the United States. And so uh, a number of us won't be able to make it that day. And so the next two meetings are canceled, which means I think, believe it's June 3rd or somewhere around there is the next meeting that we'll have. Uh, we also have some important dates coming up here um, before the next time we meet. Uh, May 28th is when 1.15 beta one is slated to be released. Uh, right after that, May 30th is when we're expected to have code freeze for 115. And then May 31st is the docs deadline where open placeholder PRs need to be open for any docs changes that are going in. And we have a couple of little things that we've been talking about doing in this release cycle. And so documentation, for example, and code freeze affects those things. And then the last uh, date we have is if you're going to KubeCon EU uh, next week uh, at 11 a.m. local time on Thursday the 23rd is when SIGAPS will be meeting. Um, we won't be having a, a intro and a deep dive. It'll be one long session. I believe Adnan's the one who's coordinating that. Uh, so that's our announcements. Does anybody have any other announcements or comments? Great. Can you all hear me? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear us? Yep, sure can. Okay. All right. Then the next thing we have um, is uh, two discussion topics. Uh, the first one, we're going to get into the tight loops and cascading failures that are impacting a cluster. And then we're going to go into bug triage stuff. Uh, the uh, tight loops and cascading failures first came out in SIG apps, or SIG architecture, last Thursday as one of the talking points. Uh, Ken, did you want to kind of describe what was going on since it's in the workloads and you, I believe you know what's going on there? Yeah, so if you remember the bug that was relatively recent about um, the scheduler placing pods on nodes that Kubelet can't run them on. Uh, Pod security context would be one, or another one if you had a runtime class that was not appropriate. Um, if you set up windows and you didn't set your change and tolerations correctly. Basically anywhere where uh, deployments in particular, replica sets actually under the hood, end up placing pods on a node where it can't schedule, the controller is gonna continue to place those pods, um, even when they terminate or, so I mean, it depends on the condition, right? Like if the scheduler actually didn't put them there, then okay. Um, but if the scheduler places them there, they launch and they terminate, then the deployment controller, you know, doing what it's designed to do will replace them. Um, the concern is that that behavior um, can lead the cluster instability. There are a couple of different things that we can do to kind of approach it. Like API machinery is talking about doing 
some things that would reject the number of requests in order to throttle all controllers. Um, the other ideas would be like, so, and, and kind of my thesis is like, well, if the scheduler is trying to place pods on a location where they can never run, I think that the correct thing to do is to solve that via the interaction between the scheduler and Kubelet. And, you know, it, it, for instance, if there are properties that prohibit a pod from ever running on a node, uh, that should be surfaced to this default scheduler, and the default scheduler should make a more intelligent decision about placement and scheduling. Like, effectively, if it leaves the pod pending instead of launching it on a node where it's going to immediately fail, um, you don't have the problem. Um, that being said, we're still being asked to kind of like look at all of the issues globally and kind of, because not all of them are identical. They're, they're like, there's more than one issue here, but to look at them and come up with a list of suggestions uh, for a smaller group, it's probably cross saves to address them individually. And it's probably a longer term thing. This isn't something that's going to get fixed in like uh, 115 or 116. The, the kind of thinking, the kind of thing I'm thinking though is that we want to, I don't want to make it harder for people who are writing custom controllers to write custom controllers. So like, I mean, the two main kits right now are either Operator Kit or Kubi Builder. Uh, and both of them are using controller runtime and controller tools at this point. There are certain things we can do to make, you know, to, to add joint libraries there that make it easier for people to consume back off logic. But I don't want to make it rocket science to produce a controller that works well by mandating that all controllers implement very complicated business logic in order to try to determine whether the pods that they're going to schedule are going to or create are going to actually be schedulable. So it's really not a concern of the controllers. That that domain is really the domain of the, the scheduler itself. Anyone else have any yeah. thoughts? Or is anyone else in attendance? Yeah, so regarding the scheduler, uh, I, I think with the move of daemon sets to actually scheduler being the one deciding on which node uh, to place the pod, we don't have any controller that actually chooses a node. So that one was certainly an right. issue between scheduler and kubelet. So I think we are pretty safe there. I recall we have some issues with mutating admissions, which creates hot loops for workloads. Uh, I guess you recall some, right? Yeah, currently the only one that I'm aware of that still does it would be, well, there's some things there, right? Like if you start mutating the staple set pod template, um, that can be problematic or the daemon set pod template. The kind of agreement that we have with API machinery is the correct way to do injection is to inject only on the pod itself. So you don't implement mutating admission control for stateful sets. You you implement mutating admission control for spot pod stack, and that's safe to do. Um, we can try to do more intelligent things around that. Um, and those hot loops weren't even under consideration, but that's good feedback. We should probably consider those at least if we're going to outline some policies going forward about what we should do. That should be considered. Yeah. But we, we still have problems with admissions that modify just the pod that you are creating because I think daemon sets, they don't check revision. They, they check if the pod that's there matches the pod template, I think. And yeah, is that still true? At least it was some time ago. It was some time ago. Does daemon set still do a comparison between the pod template and the pod template spec of the daemon set? Between pod template and uh, the pod template and the pod spec. So, like, if it rolls out a pod oh, with a real pod, yeah, it doesn't do that. It yeah, put a uh, label on it. Label the same on staples it. Yeah. So, I don't think that happens in daemon set. Or if it does, it's another issue. We don't do that comparison there. We do the comparison between replica set, pod template spec, and deployment pod template spec for sure. Yeah. So like the, the one thing we know is unsafe and the issue that arose originally was when 
someone implemented a mutating webhook that modified the replica set pod template spec and caused a tight loop inside of their deployment. There was another one with staple set where they implemented a mutating webhook on staple set, but the issue got closed and it's not clear to me exactly what the person was doing. That didn't destroy their entire workload, but it caused a ridiculous number of controller revisions. So there was a tight loop there. I just wasn't able to figure out what the tight loop was. But in general, we should consider this category of things as tight loops. I guess, and I signed up to go through and look through all of the issues, try to look through all of the issues and figure out at least do a cross correlation of them. And then the idea is to sit down and categorize them and then go talk to SIGNode and probably SIG scheduling and figure out some remediation strategies. Hey, Ken, I there's a question the that just popped up in the document. Uh, and I can't remember where this was. Is there a place that this is going to be documented or recorded? What's found out? And, and it might probably be that there's in a Google. Places. Okay. Probably in a Google Doc to start with, and then if there's some recommendations, we'd probably put it on uh, like the public documentation. So, for instance, I don't think it's captured anywhere. What I, it's not clear to me that the safe utilization of mutating webhooks um, in interaction with Kubernetes workloads objects is captured anywhere. So that's one thing we know we need to update, and we need to go update the docs to indicate it. Um, I think Daniel documented something in Kubernetes.io when they launched mutating webhooks. There's definitely documentation for mutating webhooks, but I don't think it speaks to things that will cause controller type loops. Yeah, about the controller type loops. Okay. So maybe it already exists. And then there's a deny doc for all the problems. Yeah, the one that you came up with when we yeah. looked at different remediation strategies and basically people said, well, have you tried this? Like, yeah, we thought about that. Yeah, we thought about that too. Yeah, we thought about that. The only Sorry, thing we do this. is not do it. Hmm? So Oh, I was going to say, sorry I missed this, but uh, is this, uh, like, how do we know about this issue? Is, was this opened as an issue on GitHub or we just happen to know because of, because we work on it? So, one of the issues I, I know was experienced by a GKE customer that we found out, and I think we opened an open source issue about it. Um, the staple set one was an open source issue that was, eventually closed because the guy just kind of disappeared and didn't give more information. Like I can't, I, if I can't reproduce it and I can't see what you're doing, there's not much I can do for you. Um, the replica set one where we were tight looping due to pod security context is an open issue presently that I think is labeled apps scheduling and node at this point. Um, and most of, I think Kragakis commented, I know I commented and Liget commented, and I think the, the general consensus there was node and scheduler should figure out to do something more intelligent than schedule pods at a place where they'll be, immediately be killed. Like either leave it stuck in pending if you can't schedule it, or don't start the pod if you know the security context isn't going to happen. Because uh, this, this usually, like the, the death loop thing would only occur in the event that the pod actually gets terminated and we have to delete it and recreate it. That's when you would tight loop. If the pod never, like if it gets stuck at pending or it never gets started, we'll never try to recreate the pod in any of the controller cases. So, but looking at each of them individually is kind of what SIG Architecture wants to do and then categorize them and then come up with a long-term strategy across SIGs to remediate it. Um, in terms of like looking at it as like how severe is it, there's more than one open issue around around this general topic, but it's not, not it's not I, I think the most problematic thing for users that I've seen lately. Um, but it's something that like I guess SIG architecture just wants to address or start addressing now. Because likely, if we start talking about it, it's going to be a while before we actually get software patches into an upstream release, and then we have to wait for the long tail of the old releases to roll out before we actually can get this feature rolled out. So starting on it now is probably the right thing to do. 
do we want to create at least a issue that captures some of these other issues as a discussion topic and then that might help others pitch in on they have or if they are seeing that same issue does that make sense well there is one there is an issue open already but basically i volunteered to go through and kind of create a meta issue sounds good yeah i just want to add we have definitely seen a lot of these issues in production and i've certainly filed open source bugs on github as well and from what i recall like <laughs> This usually ends up in something like very serious. Like I know demons has have been half of. I think it was, yeah, it was almost killing etcd on varieties. So this was like a thousand node cluster or something, and this issue has been just killing it because of one failed stateful set that was recreating pods. Yeah. So you usually don't see those issues, but when you see them, they are pretty serious. But we have fixed a lot of them. So that's true. Like, I mean, in terms of severity, it, in terms of priority, like does it, can it cripple a cluster? Yes. In terms of severity, meaning the number of times of occurrence, we see it, but it, it's generally not the issue I see most frequently. So, but yeah, it's something we need to do. Yeah, so, so we really just need to understand each of the individual things and then to tackle them appropriately, which I think was the plan that we'd come to in SIG architecture, was to just kind of dig in, understand them, get it figured out, and then case by case deal with it. It's part of the, uh, what is it, back in December at the, Kubernetes Contributor Summit. Uh, one of the things that Brian Grant asked everybody to focus on for this year was kind of reliability. Uh, it's one of those things that, well, you know, it improves stability and just a whole lot of factors. And so this kind of comes back to SIG architecture and just Kubernetes trying to have a little bit more of a reliability focus. Um, and this is just one of those things, right? Yeah. I wonder if, in general, we should aim for a revision-based rollout more than just comparing stuff against each other because, well, other stuff can mutate it, like admission and stuff. So that is the so, one case particular that we are basically out of it because that's something to figure out for the schedule and kubelet. But if we are comparing the pod spec or against the real pods or a similar cases, we can just have admission and use generation or something and label those pods or those replica sets with it. I think we do it. So deploy Deployment's the only one that's still using the template comparison and it's not doing it to pi spec, it's only doing it to replica set and deployment spec, which still causes still problems, but um, in maybe like I think if uh, we should go find Janet's doc because we considered using generation, but there was a problem. Like we considered a bunch of things, so we should at least share out like what um, what we already thought about doing, and then go from there and seeing what what's still left or looking for other ideas or maybe um, just having other people take a look and say, well, yeah, you considered that, but you know, what about this version of that? Maybe there's variations of, of what we looked at that are more feasible. Yeah, definitely. If Janet could find that doc and link it somewhere. Uh, I know for myself, I have changed my mind since then about some things. <laughs> After seeing okay. some strange issues. So maybe we can start fresh and figure something out. Yeah, sure. Thanks. All right, Ken, is there anything else you wanted to talk about with the tight loops or are we good? Good. 
Okay. Uh, the next section we actually have is a bug triage session. Um, we were going to do a little bit of walking through um, bug triages, but I know I was hit up on the side um, at the end of last week about uh, a question that went along with this of, should we have a separate bug triage session or how should we incorporate it into this? Because some of the other SIGs do that. So I thought before we jumped into the um, bug triaging itself, we could take a minute and talk about when would we do that as a group? Yeah, so I made this suggestion uh, last week. Uh, I, I'm, I actively follow a lot of the SIG auth and SIG apps issues and PRs. And uh, I saw a repeated pattern where I see a lot of issues come up, uh, which are like uh, similar in pattern or behavior, asking the same questions. And uh, I feel like uh, it might help the community as well as uh, Kubernetes in specific uh, to to have an actively active session because the SIG apps meeting is probably bi-weekly, right? I think so. I mean, it might no, help to have an it's weekly. Okay, sorry. So yeah, it might help to have this uh, active triaging of bugs and issues so that people know. Um, whether this is a real issue or this needs attention or this needs or this is won't fix kind of thing. So that's my opinion. Uh, well, last week we kind of decided to do it during this session. Um, one of the things we're concerned about is that we do have a lot of active participants that are in EU um, and, you know, like them getting on this call, like trying to sync up in a time that's good for both US and EU, you know, that that can be tough. Like we put it out there, the idea that we could do a, a, a second one, but I think there was kind of a consensus we would do it now. I don't, I'm not particularly opinionated either way, but. So I think we have time in these meetings. If we spend maybe 20 minutes every week or, or, or 10 minutes every week, I'm not sure if we need more than that. Maybe the easy way would be is we take a little bit of time in these meetings and do it, and then we see if we outgrow it. And if we do need to outgrow it naturally, then we add some additional time. How does that sound? That sounds good to me. Um, sounds good to me, yeah. Okay. Uh, so with that, that in mind, is, I think the amount of time we could actually spend triaging bugs is effectively infinite. Like I think if we start triaging bugs and we start triaging bugs all day long, the level at which they're produced on Kubernetes would actually still be greater than the amount of effort we can apply to triaging them. So like time boxing it is probably the only strategy that can possibly be effective. I mean, not to say that we won't do any triage outside of the meeting, but like to say like you could spend an infinite amount of time triaging bugs on Kubernetes. The whole reason they added the lifecycle stale stuff was because it was a monotonically, even with everyone in the project contributing, it's a monotonically increasing queue. Yeah, and, and for most of the projects, uh, there are folks triaging bugs in the background anyway. Uh, and then it comes together to discuss some of them. But are any of the things triaging everything in group meetings? Uh, I, I uh, doubt they are going to keep up. Again, it doesn't. It doesn't work. Even if you, even with all the triage we're doing, and, and technically we're not actually keeping up. Issues are produced at a rate that there's a reason the life cycle stale thing exists. I mean, we, the best we can do is usually pick out the ones that are high priority or burning and then go from there, or something, that, the, thing, the ones that sound extreme. Yeah, I also think there are different kind of issues, so like we should spend Definitely time there are too. where there is enough information and stuff like that, because there's hundreds of other ones where you right. just need to go back and forth with those people. So people do treat people get very confused about the difference between issues and other channels of communication like slack or stack overflow and they'll ask like 
the open issues that are effectively questions that really are appropriate for an issue forum, right? And that's just, I, I know there's an effort put into like trying to get people to seek the appropriate channel for the information they need, but that doesn't, I mean, it, it still is what it is. So, you know, that's one type. There's many different types. Some of them you can get through quickly. Um, I think the, like if we're all going to do it together, looking at the ones that are a little bit more complicated um, and that have higher impact is where I would think this time would be most valuable used. Yep. So with that in mind, Ken, would you like to take us through some triaging? Sure. Let me share my screen. Can you guys see the issue board? We can, or I can. Okay. All right. So we can go top to bottom. Some of these have already been triaged or have people assigned to them. This one is kind of interesting and worth bringing up. So effectively, when someone's creating a job with the on failure policy, um, they're seeing no back off. And the reason they're not seeing back off is because of an init container failure. When the init container fails, it's actually going to cause the pod to go back into, well, it never gets running, right? So if it's never running, it's never recorded, it stays at pending. Um, I think this person's actually issued a PR with a proposed fix for it. It's currently assigned to Morton and Foxfish, or no, to Saltfish and Janet. So looking at the PR, I mean, I, like, I feel like the issue is valid given that, I mean, the expected behavior of the job is modified by the init container and there's no way to actually get the back off limit to work when the init container fails and the pod never goes to pending. There are different things you could do about it. Like you could have a different container status that indicates that there was a failure in the init and watch that. Um, we sort of have that already, and looking at what the guy changed, or gal, or person, what they changed, they're actually trying to look at the container statuses during the pending phase. So, I mean, without looking at context, I don't know if this is the exact right thing to do and have to go look at the rest of the code in the controller but the question is this is a sign do we have well the PR has assignees uh, do we want to assign issue in order for the issue Soulfish, Janet, Morton, anybody? I think so. Okay you'll take it. Oh, I thought you were going to assign the PR author. Oh, the PR is already assigned to you. Oh, got it, got it. I'm just opening the PR. I want to have a look and uh, leave my comment after the meeting. Okay. Scale support, uh, that's not us. So replica set leads in active pods not counted in its replicas.
So I'm not clear how this would actually work. So this person is saying that you create a deployment with replicas and then you change the phase of the replicas to succeeded or failed. But the pods for replica sets are basically restart always. They're not like jobs. So it's saying RS. It looks like a pod that was evicted. That's the only way how in normal world you can fail always restart. Oh, I, I think maybe your replica set controller doesn't count its failed pods. I think we have something in the code to filter those things. Yeah, out. we do. We definitely filter out failed pods. I think we do. Not, I'm not clear. Hmm? Yeah, I think we do now. I, I recall I was there. Like I, I know we had some evicted pods and it wasn't restarting them, I think. But now it is. So ev evicted pods that are failed shouldn't be counted to replica state. When did this go in? Because if you scroll down to the uh, environment and it says Kubernetes version, it says release 1.5. Yeah, so this is really old, oh. like it's out of support. So then I guess the question is, what do we do with it? Like generally something that's one five is so far out of support that there's not much, like we're not cherry picking it. So I guess, I mean, one thing we could do is say, is just ask. Let's see if it replicates on a new version. Yeah, is this reproducible with a supported? version uh, and you might want to spell out what the supported versions are which are what 112 through 114 yeah um, so it sounds like back in 15 this may have been a problem and it's already been fixed yeah okay I mean that's the, the kind of thing that I do want to know is does it still exist I'll take this. I'll no, let's do it this way. I'll sign to me. Is there a general consensus consensus on when do we close issues? Like issues uh, like this, where if we don't get a respond response on whether it's reproducible in one hundred thirteen, twelve, or not. There. The general way we do it is if the issue is no longer useful, then we just close it. Um, the other thing that will happen is that it will automatically go stale after some period of time and self close. Right? So you can close it. Like, ideally, like you resolve the issue, and if it's just something that's not reproducible at a current stage, just and it serves no purpose, just close it. In the event that there's no response for some period of time, it will close itself anyway. I, I personally prefer to let people close their own issues that they open, um, but that's not always possible. So this is interesting, but I think we'll skip it because it's already gotten quite a bit of triage. Um, and the conversation is ongoing that when the number of jobs exceeds 500, crime gets it basically an issue with pagination. Just a cleanup. Yeah, I don't think it's worth clean up PR, not worth it. And already assigned. Yeah. Allow jobs to be rerun. Yeah. 
this is interesting. I don't know what that means. Like they, I guess like if there's a job that's in a completed state, they want to have the, the ability to automatically restart it. Yeah. Well, you cannot per se restart a job. The only reasonable approach for that one would be duplicating a job or cloning, whatever. Um, because if you would clear its current status, you will lose the data from the previous run. So I'm guessing the easiest approach would be to have a create command or some kind of a duplicate command, um, which would replicate the same job. Uh, I can't think of anything else. Yeah, I, I, I think mean, when, when, some, would, go ahead. There's nothing that would stop you from doing a kubi cuddle get on the job and then creating a new job based on the template of the old job. Exactly. Right, there's nothing that stops you from doing that. And it, like restarting the job, I don't know, that's borderline not the, that's borderline imperative, right? Like you're like, yeah. mm. you're, you're basically stumping the idea of a job. It run, it completed. Um, so I'm guessing you want to run something different, or maybe you want to have a cron job and then spin up jobs on demand, which is feasible as well with the current um, CLI tooling that we have. There is a create job from cron job. Yeah, and I, so, but this may not have anything to do with cron jobs, right? This is kind of just a user experience thing where somebody says, yeah, we fired this job off and now at some other random point, I just want to run it again. That was already run. Um, it's kind of a user experience thing more than anything else. And I don't think they're talking technically. We want to rerun the same thing. They kind of want that characteristic of we grabbed that job that was run. Sure, it had a status. Let's, you know, effectively you're, you're copying its template and then just rerunning it again, running that template and creating a new job out of it. But it's the ability, the user experience on that, that simplification. That's probably what they're asking for. So, yeah, but I mean, the honest, the honest truth is, we're probably not going to modify the V1 jobs API in order to do this. I mean, it, there, there are valid other ways to do it. Um, so what I would usually do is I would just say, tell like, I don't want to send somebody like and say, we're going to consider doing it when it's very likely we're not. So we're unlikely to consider the job API. I mean, the suggestion, you can always copy a complete job to create a new one. Um, and, uh, I haven't looked into the uh, into the suggested plugin because apparently somebody created a plugin which does exactly that. It gets and recreates the same job, maybe renaming it, and that's perfectly reasonable. Viable, right? Yeah, I'm not seeing even us doing in the CLI an option for duplicating a job. I know that the CLI guys wouldn't be thrilled about the idea. Like they're trying to get away from doing, yeah, they I'm, want to simplify the API as, or the CLI as much as possible instead of adding more things like Kubi Cuddle Expose or Kubi Cuddle Run or so. Especially, especially so, when it comes to create and like, I would say dumb, simple commands such as create set and all of those, we are rather prefer going towards the server side dynamic commands, which uh, because we currently maintain a way too many commands, which are just filling in the details of research. And I'm talking about Pretty all much. of the commands. So yeah. could, could I suggest that maybe what we tell them then is that this is the kind of thing that's uh, not going to happen inside of the API, at least not anytime soon. So the suggestion would be that they create um, their own code or a custom Kube uh, control plugin. If one does, not, does one exist that lets you retrigger a job? I just did a search for one and I didn't find well, it. Well, apparently the person, the second, com the second comment in that issue is somebody else proposing right. it's already a plugin. So there's already one. 
Uh, they're, they're talking about it, but the link is just to the plugins page, not to an actual plugin. Uh, uh, so I don't know if one exists. It's a link to just the plugins page about plugins. Uh, and so right. I would, it's saying go, you can go build this. Yeah, and, and that's what I would say. And saying, and a way to go build this would be to, you know, uh, grab a copy of the current job and then create a new job based on that. Be a pretty simple get and, and then put workflow. Um, you know, yeah. maybe to suggest that. Just to kind of lead them mm -hmm. in the right direction. That's, you want, that's like, what I ahead. put in the comment. Okay. Oh, we have a new new cube control comment called restart. Control restart. Maybe we can just implement one line there to kill the pot, kill the job, and recreate it. We could, or they could. Maybe they could. Okay, I'll add that as a mistake. <laughs> But I'm generally just going to close it because we've been where open indicate where we have restart command. How did I miss the restart? Oh, it's because we have too many. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I'm just <laughs> trying to wrap my head around all of the commands with all the moves that we're currently doing. Um, I'm surprised to see a restart. That's definitely something. Hey. So, Ken, so uh, I'm going to just call a quick time check here. we got five minutes more for this, and then there's another thing for the max unavailable for stateful set cap review, and I want to leave a few minutes for that. So just uh, pay attention to time. That's it. Not saying it's done. Just paying attention to time. Okay. So the updating deployments annotations, Janet's already looking at. The PR open. I'm just going to assign this to... So stateless service gets stuck in container creating forever. I I wonder how services are connected to ports. I don't think I got it. I don't think number of crons are getting stuck in creator create container creating. Uh, oh. I don't know why this is sig apps. Like a sig node, there seems to be the error of my yeah. 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 I'm going to remove us. And add node. Probably isn't a scheduling issue either, but it could be. Oh, cron job concurrency policy or history limit that uses an image that doesn't exist will slowly consume almost all cluster resources. Mm. Uh, huh. Oh, does it keep trying over and over and over and just fill up the history? So I'll take this as an assignment because this is related to controller hop looping. Here's another instance.
Should fixing this also go into the uh, GA cap for cron job? It's a job. It's not cron job. So uh, I would say no. It's like a well-defined behavior for something that's already GA. It's something we should look at, but probably we want to catalog it and address it in a uniform way across all of the controllers. But I'm open to suggestion otherwise. I would say like cron jobs GA should be crime jobs specific and like the dependencies for job controller that's already been GA. Yeah, we should probably take a look at what we can do there. I mean, but honestly, if you're crippling your cluster because you launched a job with an image that doesn't exist and you're not monitoring anything, but like, yes, we want safety rails to help it our users have a good time and to protect our control plane. Honestly, like having resource quotas for pod might help this, but using the system appropriately and, you know, being able to monitor the fact that you're having massive numbers of image pull failures for a cron job would probably be, like you're, you're, you're launching a massive batch workload on an image that doesn't exist or many of them. So we can put guardrails in there, but that person might be giving themselves a slightly bad time. So for this one, yeah. I've seen that one. Um, I started thinking about it, but basically the answer is um, when pod spec template would get this, I'm fine, but I'm not trying to invent this kind of um, mechanism for a job, to be honest. So the, the general consensus is, so if you look at like what KubiFlow does, KubiFlow has a TF job, which is basically a job that's made to do this. There, there are other, Volcano has a job uh, that interacts with storage. So. I mean, the, the kind of direction that the, the community seems to be going is there are extension mechanisms that would allow you to create such an, an animal, a, a storage-based job, and it is valuable. We'd love to have it as something that was contributed to open source, um, but I don't know if it's something that we're going to do as a built-in. Uh, like, we could... This, the next step here would be to implement a cat and if they want to open the cap, you know, I feel like we should take it to at least, well, we can discuss the cap and see if we think we want to do it or if it's something we want to accept. But if it's going to be a built-in, we'd probably have to take it to SIG architecture to approve adding a new built-in API. And generally, they're trying to not do that. Like, it's, it's an active non-goal to add new built-in APIs where, um, extension mechanisms are viable. Yep, totally agree. So, I mean, I guess the feedback I, I would leave is that I think, I mean, we could sponsor it as a sub project. Yeah, our use of the word sub project is incorrectly spelled everywhere on the project. <laughs> we never use the dash, and that's how all autocorrection wants to do it. Okay. okay, doesn't have to be dash. I'm cool commenting red. Yeah, I would just tell her to create a cap if she cares about it, but, and then we can consider it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, either way, cap is... Yeah, they want, you have to do a cap either way. Even for a sub-project, you need a cap. Yeah. And we need cap before we decided to 
be as a project. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying, have you considered implementing this as an extension? Uh, we might be willing to sponsor it as a SIGAP sub project. Uh, please consider submitting a cap against SIGAPs. And uh, who wants to take the assignment of the issue? Okay, I'll take it. Not big deal. <laughs> All right, so we only have. Let's let's move on for this triage. We can do some more next time. Sounds good. The the next thing we have up is uh, Max unavailable for stateful site cap review. Is somebody on who added this? Yeah, uh, this is my uncle. I added this. Uh, so we added an initial cap which was provisional, and then I've updated it with some suggestions on what might the uh, options look like for stateful sets. Um, I wanted somebody to look at it and especially people who are very familiar with how the stateful set code works to comment on if those suggestions make sense and, and uh, which one uh, should be the right way to go. I'll, uh, I have some pending comments I'll update it. But yeah, if somebody could review it uh, that would be helpful. Okay. Uh, I can take a look. Uh, where's that? Hmm. Does anyone have a link to it offhand? I think it's assigned uh, to me. I meant to self assign it, but. Oh, uh, there it is. Uh, Kenneth uh, is assigned nice. yep. and yeah. Janet. Yeah, I can take a look. Cool, thanks. All right. Um, so uh, I think that's all. Is there anything else on the Max unavailable? Doesn't sound like it. Uh, so then we have four minutes for open discussion. Does anybody have anything else they want to bring up, or do we get a few minutes back? Um, I had some suggestions. I don't know if people. Um, um, so basically, uh, I think my main question was like, uh, does SIGAPS uh, has in the past thought about uh, doing sessions? To, uh, like code walkthroughs or some deep dives into certain areas of SIGAPs. I mean, my main uh, thinking around that is like, how do we expand the reviewer and approver pool so that we can get more people to actively look into things and, uh, and maybe help out. Uh, I've seen like, uh, for example, SIG storage has done some code walkthroughs in the past I attended. Um, deep dives I've like that. What do people think? Like, would that be helpful? Uh, this is actually also one of those things that I think Paris has brought up with SIGs to help uh, expand the knowledge base is for somebody to do code walkthroughs. And I want to say, I think API Machinery has done the same thing. Um, just add more context to this. What do those of you who work on the workloads controller think about doing some code walkthroughs of the workloads controllers? We could do that, but uh, well, I don't know. So I think it's Mike who's talking right now. We did some like walkthroughs with that, but he got to like he's open for reviewer right now and likely to get approved for it. And he got there primarily by doing like active contribution and just getting shadowed. So I'm more of a fan of like you know as we triage bugs. If you want to go deeper into one assign yourself and then one of us will shadow you, help you figure it out and potentially help you fix it. And that's one way to start getting contributions into the workloads APIs. Um, if you look at like Joseph, he's, his contributions are primarily around like getting sidecars to work. So, you know, like there are different ways to grow reviewership. I'm more of a fan of doing it via contribution, but I'm not opposed to like, if we want to like spend some time doing walkthroughs of a particular controller doing that either. I just don't know if that will get you there, right? Like, if you're looking to be a more active contributor, you can, we can walk through code 
all day, but if you don't get the requisite contributions on, you're not going to get to contributorship or reviewership. So it's not, at least what I'm saying, it's not clear to me that include walkthroughs lead towards, based on how we assess contributorship and reviewership, lead towards getting there. Shadowing seems to be the way that actually um, gets the commits in or gets the reviews done and gets you to, uh, to, to the status. Yeah, I, I think the reason uh, that it's been talked about elsewhere is it helps uh, folks learn about what's going on in a controller, especially all of the tribal knowledge that's not documented in there that's outside of that. <clears throat> and I know from a video standpoint, some of the code walkthroughs have been some of the more popular videos that people are interested in looking at and watching to try and understand what's happening. And so they have actually shown to be fairly popular. So there are two. All right. I mean, it's something we're interested in doing. Let's do it. Well, well, I mean, there are two possible approaches to code tour for the workloads. Uh, there can be one general, which will just go through package controller directory pointing that, well, this is this many controllers that we have and just naming them, um, which people who are not aware of, it will be, it will be useful, useful for them. And then the other approach would be uh, picking one of the controllers and um, slice and dice it to explain more or less how it does, how it works. Um, with the latter, mm -hmm. there's the sample controller, which is um, very simplistic. I would say even minimal so that people who are interested in controllers um, can have a look. The problem with the tribal knowledge that you've mentioned, Matt, is that each of the controllers will have its own. Um, <laughs> the they are all different pieces. Yeah, the majority of the tribal knowledge is more, more like depth that we just um, created over time. I'm yeah. not saying We're it's not metal. One, but it's more like a knowledge that just grew over time because of fixing well, other guys, I, I think they're getting kicked out of the room over there. Yeah, we're getting kicked out. So how about we continue this conversation in another meeting because uh, it sounds like there's interest. Thank you everyone for coming and we'll be back in three weeks. All right, thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye, thanks. thanks. thanks.